Well, let's stand together for the reading of God's Word. Please open your Bible to Isaiah chapter number 9. Chapter 9. And uh, you haven't been a Christian very long if you don't know what verse I'm going toward. Verse number 6. For unto us a child is born. Amen. Yeah, Isaiah chapter 9. We'll read verses 6 and 7 to get started here, and then we'll go on through the passage. I think you'll find some interesting insights to add to your understanding, to deepen your appreciation of the significance of this passage as it relates to Christmas and to deepen your appreciation for what Christmas means. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 9, verse number 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom, to order it, <clears throat> let me say that again, to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Father, as I prayed earlier, and as I've been praying just almost right out through the day here thus far, we, we want to hear from you. We need to hear from you. In fact, our very life depends upon every word that comes from God. Speak to us. Lord, we need you to hear us. We need you to reach from heaven. And deliver us. We need that Lord. But we know in your scriptures that. Our sins. Grieve you and interfere. With your hearing and your reaching. And I pray now in Jesus name. That we will be ready Lord. And willing to confess. Any sin. Any iniquity. Anything at all in our lives. That displeases you. That you might be. Please, Lord God, by your grace, to wash us and to cleanse us, as you promised you would if we confess our sins. You're faithful and just to forgive and to cleanse. And because we need you to hear us, Lord God, I trust your spirit will move every heart here to make a clean uh, break of anything that is in the way of your hearing. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Boy, that's almost become the focus of my message. It's been so much pressed upon my mind, you know, but I, I think uh, the Lord would have me go ahead with the message that I have here. Uh, it's Christmas time. Amen. That's one of my favorite times of the year. Uh, boy, this whole season, you know, uh, uh, November with Thanksgiving and then followed by Christmas. It's just a great time of the year. Don't you agree? The only thing that would be better is if it wouldn't get quite so cold. You know, some folks look for white Christmases. I don't. I like bright, sunny ones. I like warm, sunny Christmases. But anyway, amen. I mean, I don't mind visiting the snow. I just don't want to live in it. But uh, we thank God for Christmas. The word Christmas means Christ sent. It's not a reference to the Catholic Mass, as some assume. It, the word means Christ sent. I have a, a YouTube thing that's relatively popular. We've had, I don't know, a few thousand, I think, of people that have looked at it. And, uh, and what it does is it goes through all these things people bring up about Christmas. And I would encourage you to find it on YouTube and give it a listen. It's a great way to uh, have a, a, a proper understanding about all the stuff that's involved in Christmas that has been attacked and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I, there are some things that, that need to be attacked. Brother Pat was singing, what was it? Santa Claus is coming through town. Was that what you were singing? And so, you know, the shepherd's hook was on its way. <laughs> But, uh, but he, 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 he caught on and he straightened that out. But anyway, just playing around. 
but yeah, we don't do Santa Claus and foolishness like that. But uh, but my my little talk there does help clarify a lot of the questions that are raised about Christmas. Things like, was Jesus really born on December 25th? And the answer is, most likely. I know that surprises people. They don't like to hear that. Some, some Christians don't like to hear that because they have spent their whole lifetime bashing that. And yet I come along and go, no, actually, if you look at the scripture and you, you calculate uh, the time of John the Baptist's birth based on historical records and the word of God, it lines up with December and it, it, you know, so December 25th is, and by the way, December 25th is not anybody's pagan holiday. Never was. It was never a pagan holiday. They missed it by about a month or so many days. And I can go on and on and on with that, but I don't have time to do that. It's not my message this morning. I just want to let you know, we won't be going there this Christmas. I often do do a couple of messages uh, treating those topics I'm not going to so I'll just refer you to my YouTube thing I'm sitting there all Christmas like in a red scarf looking like jolly old Christmas and I'm talking anyway I'm just kidding around but uh, you can you can go there to get some insight onto all those things tonight we're gonna I mean today today (laughs) and tonight we're gonna look at this prophecy the word Christmas means Christ sent For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's a Christmas verse if there is any. It's got the whole idea of giving and what was given as the greatest and most supreme gift. And the first gift of Christmas came from heaven to mankind. This prophecy tells us that Messiah, the ruler of the earth, would come as a child, would be born as a child, and it would be the Son given, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, who would take the government upon His shoulders. I like that idea. Let's just put it on Him. It says His name shall be called Wonderful. Well, how many times have we referred to Him as Wonderful? Wonderful. And his name is wonderful. How many times do we hear his name and our response is something like wonderful? Counselor. Well, he's certainly, he's certainly my counselor. I look to him for counsel, for guidance. The mighty God. Wow. That tweaks the noses of those Russellites. <laughs> this Jesus who would be born a child, uh, the son of God, is the mighty God. Oh, this one really tweaks. The everlasting Father? Now, in what way is the Son of God the everlasting Father? Well, how do you suppose you become a child of God? Through Jesus Christ. He's the one that births you to God. When you receive Jesus Christ, you are therefore born unto God. You didn't know you were the Father's grandchild. I'm just looking to see if anybody out there is going, what? Where's that coming from? The Bible. My extension in the analogy of grandfather and all that kind of stuff is coming from me. (laughs) But if you think about it, it's true. Jesus is everything to us, even a father. Some of you are still trying to get that to process. Well, look at it yourself. you got your Bible open. Who's it talking about? And it calls him the everlasting Father. Well, that does go to, of course, the whole profound doctrine of the Godhead. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Each is God, but they be only one God. So, sometimes I playfully say, they is God. to kind of help, you know, conceptualize the whole thing. But Jesus is the everlasting Father. You know, until you get that, I'm not going to move on to this message. 
So look at that. I can feel some of you are still going, mm, your brains are kind of, yeah, it was confusing enough trying to get through the doctrine of the Trinity. Now you're going to hit me with this. Jesus is the everlasting Father. Uh, by the way, it doesn't mean that our Heavenly Father is not everlasting also. By the way, we haven't taken anything away from Him, that first person of the Godhead. We're really adding to our appreciation and understanding of the Godhead. The Bible says that Jesus would be called the everlasting Father. How many of you have ever called Him that? I have. Weren't you in this room today? I called him that five or six different times. <laughs> the Bible says that this one who would be born, a child, would be the Son of God, who would take the government upon his shoulders, will be called, his name would be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. And then this, the Prince of Peace. That's where I'm going to focus this morning. We are told that the increase of his government and peace shall be eternal. It would never end. That means it would go on becoming greater and greater and greater and greater indefinitely. Wow. The increase of his government and his peace would never end. He said that he would rule upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom. That's David's kingdom. That's specifically a reference to Israel. That Jesus would occupy the throne of David. He is called the son of David, son of God. He's the promised ruler who would come from, <laughs> from David's seed that would Succeed him or succeed him on his throne and rule Israel and would have his kingdom. And he would order it and establish it with judgment and justice from henceforth even forever. Oh, mercy, how we need somebody to come and establish judgment in order to give us justice. And you've heard me say it, but. It goes to the message this morning. Isaiah prophesied of a time that we live in where judgment stands afar off. Where judgment has kind of walked away from us and justice has turned her back on us. And we desperately need judgment to come back in order to get justice to turn around and look at us again. The relationship between judgment and justice is important to understand. Judgment is the execution of wrath against evildoers. And when judgment is not executed against evildoers, justice is lost. We have no justice in a society where judgment against evildoers is withheld. The reason we don't see justice in America is because of a miserable failure to execute judgment. And if we need anything right now in America is we need the promise of Christmas. The king who would order his kingdom with judgment and justice. And he says, the zeal of the, Lord's, of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And you think probably like I do of Jesus when he said the zeal of the Lord has just eaten him up and he takes that whip and he goes into the temple and he drives out the money changers driven by a zeal, a hot, holy indignation against iniquity and wrong and injustice. The Bible says that God will with heat and passion execute judgment to the restoration of justice. So we're going to consider the relationship between Christmas and God's rule over the earth and this business of getting justice to turn around, come back, 
getting judgment to come back to us and justice to turn her face to us and not her back. All right, let's go through this passage together. Verses 1 through 7. In verse 1, God speaks of a judgment upon Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. Now, Zebulun and Naphtali were up in the northern part of the kingdom. In fact, Zebulun was just a little bit uh, southeast of Asher, and Asher was right along the coast of Tyre and Sidon. So if you understand the geography of Israel, we're up at the top, the most northern part of the kingdom. Now some think this speaks of Sennacherib in the days of Hezekiah, who judged Israel, God used him to disperse Israel, but then he came down on Jerusalem and God interrupted him. He wouldn't let him do that. Others think it's about Egypt, and some have suggested perhaps it's that meeting at the end of the kingdom. You know, Hezekiah had a child named Manasseh who became the most wicked and evil, and he had a son, Ammon, I believe, who only ruled a short time, and then, and then following him was Josiah. And Josiah was the last king of Judah before, it was, before the kingdom was taken from them, and they were brought under the uh, judgment of Nebuchadnezzar. So some people believe that this is a prophecy about when <clears throat> Josiah would leave Jerusalem to meet Necho, Pharaoh of Egypt, who was on his way to fight Babylon or to fight the Assyrians up there. <clears throat> Actually, after the Assyrian Empire fell, he went up to kind of take over and expand his kingdom. <clears throat> he was on his way. Josiah came up out of Jerusalem and encountered him. They had a big fight, and Josiah was killed in that battle. And Some think that that's what this is about because that battle took place up around Naphtali and around Zebulun. Others uh, believe it's some unknown affliction that was suffered in the northern part of Israel. But the context, to me, seems to suggest that it has fulfillment later on, leading into the time of Christ. Matthew quotes this passage in connection with Christ's ministry in Galilee. So open your Bible to Matthew 4. Let's take a look at that prophecy. Or, I mean, that reference to this prophecy. In Matthew 4, it says, Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. Galilee is the northern part of Israel. All right, It would include this area, Naphtali and Zebulun. Verse number 13, And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the sea coast, in the borders of Zebulun and Naphtali that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. By the way, don't get confused. Isaiah is a reference to Isaiah. Uh, Naphtalim is a reference to Naphtali. Zebulun, spelled differently, but it's Zebulun. Same place. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The hand of Zebulun and the hand of Naphtalim, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness, saw great light. And to them which sat in the region in shadow of death, light is sprung up. Now from that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So, you see how the Holy Spirit, through Matthew, reveals to us that the birth of Christ is the period of history that the prophet has in view. This time when Zebulun and Naphtali uh, would come under some distress and duress and problem, a kind of dimness that would come upon the land, that that is the period during which or in which Christ would be born, Christ would come. This one who would come to take the government upon his shoulders, the one who would occupy the throne of David, who would order the kingdom and establish it. You understand, the Spirit in this prophecy goes out of his way to make sure you know we're talking about David's throne. We're talking about David's kingdom. That's the one we're talking about. That would be, of course, the kingdom over which David ruled. 
I like it when I can bring out some very amazing and profound insight like that. But it is interesting and important because it means we're talking about the kingdom of Israel as it was constituted under David. This prophecy tells us that God would send his son into the world, into the earth, <clears throat> who would occupy David's throne and who would order and establish David's kingdom. <clears throat> Read it carefully and you'll see it's talking about David's kingdom. Just in case you missed that, let's go back and look at it again a little bit more carefully. Isaiah chapter 9, <coughs> uh, at verse number 7, Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end, upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom. I will argue that the antecedent for his is David. Upon David's kingdom. Now, you might argue that, no, the antecedent here goes back to the everlasting father, that one who's named in all those ways. I don't think so. Some of the argument gets a little bit more technical than we want to go through right now, but grammatically and all that kind of good stuff, uh, the argument is sound to say that the antecedent here refers back to David. So, upon the throne of David and upon his, his kingdom, see, to order it, to establish it. Now, why did it need to get ordered and established? In other words, here's what I'm trying to say. If you lived in this day, and Hezekiah was the king, he was a good king, and things were pretty well ordered, and the kingdom at that time was, I think you would argue, established. So why does it need to be ordered and established? Because the prophecy looks forward to a time of dimness in the land, of trouble in the land, when the kingdom had been taken from them. This is talking about a, rest, a restoring of the kingdom. And that's the way all the Jews read it too. They read this as indicating Messiah would come and restore the kingdom to Israel. That's why when you come to the end of Jesus' ministry, and really all through his ministry, you see indications of the disciples' expectation that Jesus was going to establish the kingdom. He was going to take David's throne, and he was going to order and establish the kingdom. That's what they were expecting. And Jesus never said, no, we're not going to do that in so many words. He allowed them to believe that. Why? Because that was the promise. That was the offer. The offer was that he would take David's throne and he would establish the kingdom and restore the kingdom to Israel so that after 40 days of teaching concerning the kingdom, well, 10, 20, 30, 40, so. After 40 days of teaching on the kingdom of God, after Jesus rose again, did you know that? The Bible says that Jesus took 40 days, he spent that 40 days teaching his disciples the things concerning the kingdom. After they had spent 40 days learning about the things concerning the kingdom, just before Jesus ascended into heaven, what did they ask him? Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Isn't that interesting? That tells me that there wasn't anything in what Jesus taught them for 40 days that would cause them to say, well, we know that the kingdom isn't going to be restored right now. So, in other words, the hope and expectation of the kingdom being restored was still on the table at that time. The prophecy of Isaiah was that this Christ would come, he would take the throne of David, he would restore the kingdom to Israel. <clears throat> And yet we know also that when Jesus was here, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. The prophet describes this time as a time when the nation would be multiplied, but not increased with joy. He describes it, and that's in verse 3. He says their joy would be in temporal things and the character of those, uh, and I'm sorry, of the character of those who divide the spoil. Looking forward to the time when the yoke of his burden would be broken and the staff of his shoulder and the rod of his oppressor would be broken. In other words, it's a time in history when Israel is looking for relief from the oppressor. 
That's what this prophecy is saying. It's describing that as the time during which this prophecy is fulfilled. That wouldn't fit Hezekiah's day. That wouldn't even fit Josiah's day. It might fit it after Josiah, but it wouldn't fit his day. <clears throat> They're looking forward to a time when the yoke of their burden would be broken. When the oppressor who oppressed them would, their power over them, I should have said, would be broken. And they would be able to be restored where they have a, the son of David, the promised son of David, on the throne of David, ruling and establishing and ordering the kingdom. And so I'm saying this is not talking about that kingdom yet to come. It's the, talking about the kingdom that's on the earth right now. And it was offered, this, this king who came, Jesus Christ, came to offer it to Israel. That's why he said, go only to the house of Israel. Not because he didn't intend to save. And you see, we have kind of gotten zeroed in, and understandably, on this, that the purpose of Christ's coming was focused on the redemption of mankind. Well, amen. No question about that. But it also included other things. One of them was the restoration of the kingdom to Israel. He came to do that for them. And that's what this particular prophecy is about. See, this prophecy isn't about him coming to save mankind from their sin. There are prophecies about that. And that is what he came to do. Hallelujah. Amen. He did a good job of that one. As he does a good job with all that he does. But that's not what this prophecy is about. This prophecy is about him coming to take the government into his power. This prophecy is about him coming to offer, to restore the kingdom to Israel. Remember, when you say the kingdom, what do you mean? Some of you are afraid we're going to go into 25 minutes. But now that you've been so educated in this, I can do it in about one. The three kingdoms, kingdom of God, kingdom of darkness, kingdom of man. The kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of, of light, which is God's kingdom, are at war over control of the kingdom of man. Jesus came to defeat the kingdom of darkness and to restore the kingdom of man back to God. It's real simple. So when we talk about the kingdom, we mean that kingdom to which God gives the dominion and the sword. The dominion includes stewardship over the resources of the earth. The sword involves stewardship of judgment. So he had given that kingdom to Israel and then narrowed it down to Judah, but then took it from Judah and gave it to Nebuchadnezzar and so on. Jesus, this prophecy is about Jesus coming at a time when Israel was under oppression, when they didn't have the kingdom. And Jesus coming and taking the government onto his own shoulders and then restoring Israel to her former glory. That's what this prophecy is all about. And it refers to him as offering peace. The prophet contrasts the coming upon God's people as every battle of the warrior is with confused noise and garments rolled in blood, but what is coming upon his people at this time will be with burning and fuel of fire. And John talked about Jesus baptizing with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And that fire refers to a judgment. <clears throat> now this seems to speak of the coming destruction of the temple prophesied by Jesus in Luke 21, something we talked about this morning in our Bible study, but we'll not spend time there right now. What brings this upon the people? The promise of Christ brings upon the people this time where there's either going to be peace or terrible destruction. Peace or destruction. 
is presented before the people at Christ's coming as it's prophesied in this, in this uh, particular prophecy. An offer of peace refused. At his birth, the offer was, remember, peace or on earth peace. Goodwill toward man. That was the declaration of the angels. On earth peace. Goodwill toward man. The prince of peace had been born. The fulfiller of this prophecy. The child, the son who had been given. This one who would come to offer peace. God's gift of his son included an offer of on earth peace. Goodwill toward men. When we hear that, we think of that peace that passes understanding. We are all privileged to have in Christ. We think perhaps of the joy unspeakable and full of glory. And we think of the reconciliation between the sinner and God and, and having peace then. But the language here is not peace in the heart of the believer or peace. That is true. All of those things are true. But the peace being spoken of here is peace on earth. What's envisioned here is an offer from God. I have sent someone to you. And if you receive him, he will bring peace in this earth. That's, what he's, that's what's going on here. So when the angels declared peace on earth, goodwill toward men, just hold off and believe what they said. Have audacious faith. Bold to believe what it says and not make it into something else so you can believe it. In other words, the angels announced peace, uh, you know, on earth peace, goodwill toward men. But there's been no peace. So he must not have been talking about, you know, like peace on earth. He must have been talking about like peace in my heart. Don't try to help God. <clears throat> Don't try to bail them out. Don't try to fix the Bible so that you can believe what it says when you have trouble with believing. Don't do that. Just leave the Bible alone. Go ahead and do this. Say, I must be missing something. <laughs> now, that's a humble way to do this. You, you come against something like that. Uh, the Bible declared Jesus' birth with the... With the uh, Offer uh, on earth peace, goodwill toward men. That was obviously the disposition of God in the giving of His Son. It was a goodwill gesture to mankind. Boy, mankind, you need my Son. Psalm 2, go back there again. Look at that. I've set my Son upon the holy hill. I've given my Son. If you will receive Him, you'll have peace on earth. Now, I added the conditional, if you will receive Him, that's not mentioned directly in this prophecy, but it is implied. At his birth, the offer was peace on earth, and goodwill toward man. Luke 2, verse 14, glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. The peace that's offered is the restoration of the kingdom to Israel. The peace that's offered is, I have sent the promised Messiah He's going to take David's throne. He's going to establish and order the kingdom. And from that kingdom, there will be peace on the earth. Well, we never saw Jesus in the Gospels. We, we never saw him uh, go over to Jerusalem and walk into Herod's palace and say, Okay, buddy, you're out of here. That's what the disciples were expecting him to do. The disciples were expecting him to mass an army or just to walk in there and, and just do one of his zoom, zoom things. Right? Just wipe him out. That's what they were looking for. They were anticipating that throughout. They never stopped expecting that. All the way to the point when Jesus was going to it was, was departing. All the way to there. Okay. Are we ready to go? Are we going to fulfill that Isaiah 9 thing right now? Let's do this thing. I'm ready. Right? But Jesus said, 
You don't need to trouble yourself with those things that God has put into his own power. That's important because he didn't say, he didn't say, I've been teaching you guys for 40 days and you still don't get it? That's not what he said. Now, there are some times in the Gospels when I could argue that that's pretty much what he did say to them. Like, how long of a time have I been with you and you still don't get it? Just, you know, that probably wasn't the tone he used, but you know what I mean. So it's important to note that in Acts chapter 1, Jesus didn't scold them for having failed to listen carefully to what he taught them, which tells me that what he taught them was not in any way contradictory to their expectation. They had a legitimate expectation for the kingdom to be restored to Israel. And Jesus as much as confirmed that when he said not, no, the kingdom won't be given now, that's going to be later. He didn't say that. He said, you don't need to concern yourself with the things that God has put in his power. It's going to happen in his time. Your expectation will be realized. That's going to happen. But don't focus on that. Leave that to God. He'll do it in his time. Here's what I want you focused on. You're going to receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you're going to be witnesses to me in Judea, Samaria, and under the uttermost parts of the earth. That's what I want you focused on. That's important. But he didn't say, your hope of the kingdom being restored is over. The fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah is still on the table. And what does that prophecy entail? Christ ruling upon the throne of his father David, establishing and ordering the kingdom, establishing or bringing peace on earth. God's gesture of goodwill toward mankind. Wow. Very interesting. So the disciples long for the restoration of the kingdom of Israel. And that's alluded to repeatedly throughout the Gospels, as I pointed out. And yet Jesus said during his ministry, wait, wait i got to go back and set it up better. Remember the prophecy says, he's the prince of peace. It's about peace. The focus is peace. Peace is mentioned too, I think, at least two times, maybe three times in that passage. It, it's, it's about peace, peace on earth. And at the time of the fulfillment of the prophecy, what do the angels focus on? On earth, peace, goodwill toward man. That's what it's about. And yet Jesus said in Matthew 10, 34, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. And then in Luke 12, 51, Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth? I tell you nay, but rather division. Okay, Lord, you got to help me out here. What am I missing? In other words, Lord, you got to help me out. I'm not going to help him out. And get him out of a mess he got himself into with his confusing Bible. No, I want him to help me out. Straighten me out and show me what's going on here. He prophesied that they would reject the offer of his peace. He predicted that. Open the Bible to Matthew 21. He predicted that they would reject the offer of his peace. Matthew 21, 33, here another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it in round about and digged a wine press in it, built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. And when the time came, or excuse me, and when the time of the fruit drew near, He sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandmen took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. 
Again, he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, they will reverence my son. Now let's just pause there for a moment and reflect. Who's he talking? What's he talking about here? God came down and met with Abraham and, and he set up the whole kingdom thing with Abraham, the promise to him. He planted a vineyard. And he was looking for the fruit of that vineyard to be rendered to him. The fruit of the kingdom. But the Jewish people continued consistently over and over again to fail to bring forth the fruit. And so God sent his prophets to rebuke them and to preach to them. And they stoned some and they killed others. Finally, the father sent his own son. And then verse 38, but when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and let us seize on his inheritance. You see, the rulers of the Jews didn't want to give up their place. They didn't want to give up their control. They didn't want to give up. They didn't want to yield their power to somebody else. And Jesus discerned that about them. The Bible goes on to say in verse 39, And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. And he was hung outside the city, wasn't he? When the Lord therefore of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? And those Jews to whom he was teaching this parable said to him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. Now, if you follow this and you got it, here you're going to get this. Now listen to what he says, what he says next. Verse 42, Jesus saith unto them, Did ye never read in the Scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same as become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing. And it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, indefinite, not naming some particular one, just saying a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder, and that takes us to the prophecy in Daniel that we don't have time to go into in Daniel 2, the interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, the stone that comes and crushes the whole thing to powder and all that. But get the idea here? Jesus is saying, the kingdom is offered to you. How many times did he have to say this? On the hillside there of Olivet, looking over Jerusalem, he lamented, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered you together as a hen doth her brood, and ye would not. I sent one prophet after another, after another, after another, and now the Son of God Himself is here, and you're stubborn. You still won't yield to God the fruit that is His. You won't do it. Luke 19, 12 to 27 does the same thing as I begin to move toward the conclusion here. He said a certain, I'm, I'm going to go and begin reading now, but you might want to open your Bible there and follow along because these two parables really tell you or give you a lot of insight into the answer to the question, hey, if Jesus Christ upon his birth began the fulfillment of Isaiah 9, then where's this peace he talked about? Where's it at? It helps you understand what happened. Luke 19, 12, he said, Therefore a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. Now that's talking about the kingdom to come, the one we pray for, thy kingdom come, that one. That's later on. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. But his citizens hated him. Who are his citizens? Everybody else except the servants. The differentiation here is the servants and the citizens. The servants are those that are under his employ, if you will, under his charge, those to whom he gave his goods. We know from other scriptures he gave his goods to his disciples, to his church. He gave the church the keys of the kingdom and he gave his goods to the church to be a steward and to occupy it till he returned. 
So who are the citizens? Everybody else. That gets proved even more as we proceed. His citizens, so in other words, this envisions a situation in which Jesus has given his goods to his servants and left, but everybody in the world is considered one of his citizens. He got the government onto his shoulders, if you're paying attention. It's his now. Everybody's under him. But they hate him. You see, they won't receive the peace he's offering. And they sent a message after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. Scratch Acts, I'm sorry, scratch Psalm 2 in the margin there. The heathen are raging. The people are imagining a vain thing. They're sending word after him saying, we're not going to have that man reign over us. That's what's going on right now. His citizens hated him. Verse 15, and it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called unto him to whom he had given the money that he might know how much every man gained by trading. And then it goes through his judgment there. And I'm not going to go through that. Uh, it's just about the fact that those of us who are his servants, who've been given his goods and have squandered that and have not exercised our stewardship faithfully, are going to give an account. We will give an account. But what happens to the rest of them, to the citizens? Verse 27. But those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them. Who's that? The citizens. The rest. Everybody else in the world. Other than his servants. Those who obey the gospel become his servants. Those who disobey the gospel are his enemies. But those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither... And slay them before me. Now we're trying to understand. How is it that this prophecy Isaiah 9 says. That Christ would come. Take the government on his shoulders. And be the prince of peace. And offer peace to the world. And yet the world has not seen peace. Rather what we've seen is greater turmoil. In other words, it got worse, not better. The Jews got all stirred up by his coming and went against them. Rome was drawn in to this crazy mess and used the legal authority of Rome to execute him. And he was killed on the cross of Calvary. Now, God has a plan overarching this whole mess, which... <laughs> in an amazing way made all of those things work toward the greater good of our redemption of our salvation Amen. hallelujah but that doesn't take anything from the crime in other words nobody can stand before God and say and, and argue this well yeah I rejected your son and crucified him but really that was just part of your plan so you could provide redemption for all mankind so actually, I was doing your will, and, and that's not going to work. Amen? And that's proved in several places in Scripture. The book of Acts, where the apostle Peter said uh, that you crucified the Son of God. Whew, and he, he preached that as a judgment against them. So we have surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ. We have entered into his peace. You see, the offer is peace. Or punishment. Got to get two P's in there. There's peace or pulverization. That's an even better one. The offer was peace. But they rejected the peace. We who are translated into the kingdom of God's dear son. Are the ones who stand with the kingdom. 
And we've been given his goods to occupy the place he has taken in the earth until he returns. We are saved from the wrath to come. We offer the terms of surrender. We offer the terms of surrender, which is to confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead. And then whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We offer the terms of surrender, which is God commands all men everywhere to repent and to believe on his son. We offer those terms of surrender. And if they will accept the terms of surrender, they will be at peace. And they will not have to face that awful judgment when he says, those who said that they would not have me to reign over them, gather them together right now, put them all in front of me, and now slay them all. We were preserved from that because we have accepted the terms of surrender. So our mission, when we go forward now, I'm going to explain this in detail tonight in the 5 o'clock service. I'm going to explain what this means about how we preach the gospel. I'm going to explain what this means about how we are positioned in the earth on behalf of Christ to carry on this message, this mission. Jesus said, I'm withdrawing the offer of the kingdom from you, Israel. But he didn't say, I'm withdrawing it from the earth. He didn't say that. He said, I'm going to give this kingdom to a nation that brings forth the fruit. And down through history, that's exactly what the sovereign Lord Jesus Christ has done. He's given the kingdom to a nation of his choosing. Takes it, passes it to another, and that's what Jesus has been doing. And it will always go to a Gentile nation until the Gentile nation, until the times of the Gentiles are done. Then it will be restored to Israel. And that will be the final conclusion of the prophecy of Isaiah. Follow that? All right, let's stand together. That's enough for now.